Chapter 19 A Fiendish Plot Nancy felt sheepish. She suddenly remembered having told the police to arrest Red Quint. A man answering this one's description is wanted on a disorderly conduct complaint, the trooper said. The complaint was lodged by somebody named Nancy Drew. I'm Nancy Drew, the young detective said. You? Then what are you... Say, all of you come along with me. The officer got into his car, taking Quint with him, and told Nancy to follow in her car. But as she trailed the trooper towards state police headquarters, Nancy's brain was in a whirl. She had wanted Quint arrested. Perhaps now, out of spite, he would never reveal the whereabouts of the wooden lady. When they arrived at headquarters, Nancy told the officers about Fay Lane and the abduction of Captain Easterly. I don't want to press my charge against Red Quint, she concluded. I'm sure he's not a thief like the other two. But maybe he'd be better off in jail for his own protection. I don't know what Flip Fay might do to him if he found out how much Quint has told us. The police captain seemed to think this was a fair proposition. Meanwhile, he said, they would check the sailor's story and speed up the search for Flip the Crow Fay. Suddenly, Quint who had been listening quietly, said, Could I speak to Miss Drew in private? The officer agreed. Nancy and Quint went off to a corner. Miss Drew, Grizzleface whispered, You've been square with me. I want to be square with you, so I'll tell you where the figurehead is. You take the road to Truro, but turn off just before at the sign that says Wright's Cove. About a mile the other side of a settlement, you'll find a little white house with an old sea trawler rotting away in the front yard. That's Mrs. Parker's house. That's the place. Nancy thanked him, and the three girls hurried out to their car. Do you think Quint told you the truth? Bess asked, worried. Maybe he's just putting us off the scent so he can find the treasure himself when he gets out of jail. I think he's telling the truth, Nancy said. It was a beautiful drive, but the girls scarcely noticed the trim cottages, the gardens, the blue sea and sky as they sped on their way to the hiding place of the figurehead. Nancy finally turned down a sandy lane. There it is, George cried. White house, old fishing boat. There's a sign, Mrs. Parker's guest house. The girls jumped out of the car and ran up the brick walk. At that moment, a woman came around from the backyard carrying a hoe. Nancy told her what they were looking for. Is the figurehead here? she asked. Oh, that old thing, Mrs. Parker smiled. It's out in the woodshed. A man named Burns brought it here with him. No, it was Mr. Bleeker, I guess. He owed me twelve weeks board, and the poor man didn't have a cent. He offered me the figurehead in place of the money. Said I could sell it, but I never bothered. How glad Nancy was that Mrs. Parker had not sold Melissa. Are you girls collecting antiques? Mrs. Parker went on. I have some sandwich glass, if you'd like to look at that. No, we're just interested in the figurehead, Nancy told her, smiling. May we see it, please? Certainly. Mrs. Parker, still carrying the hoe and quite unaware of her visitor's excitement and impatience, led the girls through the garden to the woodshed. She unhooked the door and they stepped over the sill into semi-darkness. It's behind these boxes, the woman said, pushing them aside. Nancy helped her, and presently in the dim light she saw the long-lost figure of Melissa. The wooden lady was indeed like the carved lady on the snuff box. The three girls picked up Melissa and carried her into the yard. She's beautiful, Bess said. She must have looked lovely on the ship. Mr. Burns, or was it Bleeker, Mrs. Parker explained, told me the thing came off a pirate ship, but I don't believe those old yarns. I've heard too many of them. The girls exchanged glances. Was her former boarder a descendant of a pirate? Had he removed the ruby from it? Hardly likely, or he would have been able to pay his rent. Would you sell the figurehead? Nancy asked. Of course I'll sell it. What would you give me for it? A bargain was quickly made, since Mrs. Parker was glad to get rid of Melissa. The girls carried the wooden lady to the car and with some manipulating, managed to get it inside. Then Nancy drove back quickly to the guest house where the girls were staying. 
Their hostess was amused to see that they had found an old figurehead. She had no objection to their taking Melissa upstairs. I can't wait, George kept saying. Let's cut her right open and look for the ruby. They had just closed their door when the telephone in the lower hall rang. A moment later, the owner of the house knocked on the girl's door. A message for you from Captain Easterly, Miss Drew, she said, coming in. You're to follow him to the Bonnie Scott at once. He'll leave a rented rowboat on shore for you. Nancy was amazed. Was that all? she asked. He said he was moving back. The woman hesitated as though she did not want to reveal the rest of the message. In a moment, the reason was clear. She was about to lose three boarders. The captain said you were to move back too. Then we'll have to go, Nancy said. I'm sorry. We'll pay the full day's rent. Once more, the girls packed, then drove to the beach with Melissa. The promised rowboat was there. A slip of paper with Nancy's name printed on it lay on the floor. George offered to return the rented car. While she was gone, Nancy and Bess put Melissa and the luggage in the rowboat. George soon returned and they set out. Reaching the clipper, Nancy called to Captain Easterly. A moment later, Mr. Ogden appeared. Hello, girls, he said, smiling. You got here ahead of the captain. What made you change your mind? Nancy asked. Mr. Ogden said that he had decided after they left that his company had been unduly hasty. He had telephoned his office and convinced his superiors to let Easterly buy the clipper. I had quite a time locating the captain, Mr. Ogden concluded, but I did finally. Well, come aboard, girls. I see you picked up a figurehead. He let down the rope ladder. George and Bess climbed up the side, then tossed down a rope which Nancy tied around the figurehead. They hauled Melissa aboard, while Nancy went up the ladder. Mr. Ogden helped George and Bess carry the luggage to their former cabin. Nancy remained on deck to wait for Captain Easterly. She did not want to leave the figurehead for one minute. In a few moments, Bess returned. Excitedly, she whispered that George hoped Nancy would begin hunting for the ruby at once. Mr. Ogden was in the captain's quarters writing. George would keep track of him and warn the others if he came on deck. I think this is the place to start, said Nancy, eager to see if the ruby were still there. She pointed to a small block of wood forming a part of one shoulder. This doesn't match the other shoulder, she pointed out. Nancy ran to the stern of the ship where she had seen a locker with tools. In a moment, she came back with a chisel. With it, the girls quickly removed the odd block of wood. Goodness! Bess cried, gaping at the hole below it. In the hole lay a tiny metal box, rusted almost to paper thinness. Inside, on a velvet lining, was the precious ruby. The fabulous gem of the Orient glinted in the sunlight. The girls were so excited that they did not hear stealthy footsteps behind them. Suddenly, they were startled by a harsh masculine voice. Thanks for all your footwork! Nancy and Bess whirled to see Flip Fay smiling triumphantly. I'll take the ruby, he said, reaching for it. Nancy held on tightly to the ruby and ran for the rail, while Bess screamed and clutched at the thief. Simultaneously, Mr. Ogden appeared. Instead of assisting the girls, he suddenly laughed raucously. Pushing Bess to the deck, he helped the crow overpower Nancy and took the ruby from her. Fell right into our trap, didn't you? Ogden gloated. The smart Nancy drew. Stop the gab and get to work, Faye ordered. Nancy glared at Faye's companion. I see now. You're not Josiah Ogden at all. You're Lane, the man who kidnapped Captain Easterly. The man smirked. Anything else you want to know? He asked impudently as Faye produced some heavy rope. In spite of the struggle they put up, the two girls were tied securely to the foremast. Then George, who had been locked in a closet, was brought up and bound also. You should have paid attention when you got my warning, Flip sneered, tying a final knot. Easterly must have known what the lizard meant. Lane spoke up. If Farnsworth had let me buy the ship, you wouldn't be seeing land for the last time. What have you done with Captain Easterly? Nancy asked her captors. She was sure now he too had been tricked. 
The men looked at each other, then Faye said enigmatically, You might have a chance to say goodbye to him yet. With that, he and Lane walked quickly to the anchor windlass. With a sinking heart, Nancy watched them haul up the anchor. Then they climbed over the rail. Have a nice trip, Flip Faye called as he disappeared from view. The tide's going out, and there's a stiff breeze to take you to sea tonight. They've set us adrift, Bess wailed as the girls struggled desperately to free themselves. End of chapter 19